we were much more interested in an art form that we could contribute to on equal level, an art form that was wide open to invention. What would happen if one were to go out in the daytime, put on a reflective vest, a hard hat with a nice American flag on it, what could one get away with? Well, the answer is one could get away with a hell of a lot. So my always be learning speech is gonna take two forms. There's first gonna be my inspirational background speech on how I became the public artist that I am today. And then there's going to be the sales pitch so I'm gonna stay long on the inspirational background story and short on the sales pitch. Um, you, this is a Kickstarter, so I'm sure you're very familiar with sales pitches. So I like to start way back to my origins. I was born in Richmond, Virginia on September 18th, 1979. I just celebrated my 35th birthday. Uh, time flies. And shortly after my birth in Richmond, Virginia, my family moved to Cincinnati, Ohio, which is a very decent place to grow up, really. A uh, great city. <clears throat> it's by no means a metropolis like New York City, but a great, decent, down-home family <laughs> place to grow up. <laughs> Not quite. <laughs> and during my childhood, I engaged in all of the activities that normal children do. Uh, for example, riding on red-haired bananas, such as I do in this particular photo. And I also began to draw. Now, drawing is not necessarily an uh, abnormal thing for a child to do. Uh, it's actually uh, probably the most natural things that children can do. So at this age, I, like most of my peers, began to draw and capture the essence of what they saw around them. This, this particular case is a portrait of a fellow student. Now, when we get the age of 15, 16, adolescence. This is usually the part and the, the place where people make a choice whether or not they want to be an artist or do something else. So artists are usually those who continue to draw after childhood. And that's what I decided to do. You have to make a deliberate decision at this point in time. And I was fortunate enough to be accepted into the School for Creative and Performing Arts in Cincinnati. And for all of its merit, this school, it had some flaws. <clears throat> Chiefly among them would be this. At the School for the Creative and Performing Arts, we were taught to appreciate and almost worship the masters of Western European painting. We were taught that these artists were the yardstick by which we should measure ourselves. And we were taught to paint like Picasso. And if we could paint like Picasso, we were good artists. We were taught to appreciate Vincent van Gogh. And if we could paint like Vincent van Gogh, we were good artists. The problem with that was this. We weren't from Europe. And we weren't painting, in some cases, 100 to 125 years in the past. We were much more interested in an art form that we could contribute to on equal level an art form that was wide open to invention. And naturally, when I say us and we, I'm talking about youth, any youth growing up in the late 20th century. We're talking about graffiti art. So graffiti, for me, at this age, adolescence, did two things. It allowed me to be a part of a group. All my friends were writing graffiti. And it allowed me to be <clears throat> an individual. Verbs was my tag name. And in that name, I was allowed to uh, choose an identity and at the same time, write collectively with my friends. As antisocial as people try to make graffiti, it's an extremely social endeavor. You're always with a partner. You're always with a group. You're always watching for each other's uh, back to make sure you're not getting arrested. So in Cincinnati, Ohio, around the year 1995, I began to go up and down the streets of Cincinnati writing verbs. Okay, And traditionally, graffiti artists will take a name and make a derivative design on that name. In this case, I'm using V-E-R as my uh, bubble letter. And that's just a traditional way for a graffiti artist to behave. This is another uh, uh, painting of Ver on a, uh, a store gate. So an essential part of graffiti writing vocabulary is trains. We didn't have subway trains in Cincinnati. We had freight trains and commuter cars, as you can see here. Here I am painting 
uh, verbs on a commuter train. Trains were essential in allowing us writers from the Midwest communicate to uh, our counterparts on the East and West Coast. So this was our conduit by which we could uh, get coast to coast exposure. Uh, and if any of you all have ever wondered, if you've been in a train yard or maybe seen a train from far away, has anyone ever wondered why are graffiti artists painting just the lower half of the train? Well, <laughs> I, I realized this until I got up close to a train. Uh, you see that little bucket to the left there? It's shiny, it's very hard to see in this picture. I had to stand on that to get that high. I'm really about a foot shorter than that wheel there. So uh, a lesson I learned while writing graffiti is that if you want to do something outside, you have to go about five times bigger than what you uh, originally planned to because you have to base your size based on everything else that exists. And there's a lot of large things outside. Uh, so here I am in 1997. I'm about, I'm about 17 years old, and I am completely smitten and satisfied with the graffiti skills that I worked so hard to attain. At this point, I was only interested in being a traditional graffiti writer. I was imitating my peers just like uh, uh, apprentices in the Renaissance imitate uh, the masters, you see. But as I went further and further, further into my adolescence, I began to accept influences, ones that would change the course of my uh, artwork in ways that I didn't exactly know at the time. This is my good friend Andre Highland who I've known for 30 years now, and I still talk to him today. I uh, met him in 1984. Uh, I think we were in kindergarten. And Andre began to write graffiti with me at this point. But Andre was not interested in a name-based style of graffiti. He was much more interested into a Keith Haring style of graffiti where um, he would, his characters would change night after night, but it was still distinguished by a very clear uh, uh, set of visual clues, just like you know a Keith Haring work no matter what Keith Haring is doing. It's just a, a, an indelible signature that he's got. Andre had the same quality. So myself and Andre began to go around Cincinnati, me as the traditional graffiti writer, and Andre as kind of the alternative to the graffiti writer, and he's painting his characters alongside me. <clears throat> now at the same time, late 90s, a guy named Stephen Powers, also known as Espo, maybe some of you all are familiar with Espo. Um, we heard word through the graffiti grapevine that this individual, Stephen Powers, was going on the streets of New York, okay, dressed as a store owner and painting uh, over existing graffiti with a pale swatch of color, in this case, pale yellow, and then going into that color with black and carving out Espo in his name there. And it was a brilliant strategy, going out in the daytime. So when myself and Andre heard word of this through the graffiti grapevine, now, I remind you all that in the late 90s, the internet was around, but it was by no means the way that graffiti artists shared information at all. It was either magazines or pictures. When we heard this, our mind was blown, and mine in particular. So I decided, wait a minute, if this guy's going out in the daytime and making graffiti, what would happen if one were to go out in the daytime and one were to put on a reflective vest and one were to put on a hard hat with a nice American flag on it, what could one get away with? Well, the answer is one could get away with a hell of a lot. And here I am uh, applying that methodology with a little bit of embellishment, you see? And Andre is adopting the same practice. Now, with this hard hat and construction suit uh, disguise, Andre and I are, are able to manipulate things that construction workers normally manipulate, street signage. So some of you all may be wondering, hey, did you guys just go around and just take off the signs from the street and just be that irresponsible? No. If you go out today, just walk around anywhere in Brooklyn, anywhere in New York, and you look for street signs that have been knocked over by cars, you're going to see a lot. And that's exactly what myself and Andre used, is signs that were either hit or discarded. And it's a phenomenal amount of waste that you can see in any urban area in America. And we use those signs to uh, reappropriate. So this is an example of a no parking sign flipped upside down to say on 
and there's an off switch there. So that's kind of my take on uh, the no parking sign. Here's Andre's response. So myself and Andre are really trading back and forth ideas. It was my first great collaboration on the street, and it actually taught me how to collaborate. And we would go to, uh, to, for newspaper boxes that already had graffiti on them, take them back to the studio, either my house or his house, paint them up, and put them right back on the street and put chains around them. Now, some of this may be familiar to street artists at this point, but in 1998 in Cincinnati, Ohio, uh, not too many people were doing this. We were just going on what we had seen through the graffiti grapevine and what our imagination would let us do in terms of what we could get away with. And here's our uh, newspaper there that we put in there. Also at this time, nine, late 90s, we heard word through the graffiti grapevine that there were two artists from the East and West Coast, respectively. A guy named Cause, who you all may be familiar with, his studio is here in, uh, in uh, actually in Williamsburg, and a guy named Barry McGee, also known as Twist. We heard that these artists were going around New York and taking out the bus posters and manipulating them and putting them right back up in there. So when Andre and I heard word of this, we said, check, we'll do that too. We've got the vest, we've got the hard hat. And in Cincinnati, to do that was so easy. All it took was a Phillips head screwdriver, which you would go underneath the, 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 the bus shelter there, unscrew it, and you'd pop out the poster and it'd be the, yours for the taking. In New York, they're all locked up, and I don't know how they did it, but we decided to do this in, in Cincinnati. So we would run up and down Cincinnati doing this style of alternative graffiti. No one was using the term street art then. Not one person that I know of. And also, the, uh, the now uh, extinct uh, phone booth, uh, we used to change out the signs in those booths as well. I don't think there is an existing phone booth either in Cincinnati or New York City or anywhere at this point. That kind of immediately dates this type of work, but we would switch out those signs, verbs on one side, Andre on the other, and you can see that dialogue there. You know, you can see the, 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 the call and response going on where Andre is changing his, his, uh, his characters and I'm changing my letter forms there. And not even uh, grocery carts were exempt from the shenanigans we were pulling uh, in Cincinnati, Ohio. And here I am with a Captain Crunch uh, box in front of my face. Uh, and in 1998, I graduated from the School for Creative and Performing Arts, and I was fortunate enough to be accepted into Pratt Institute in Brooklyn, New York. So I left the calm, complacent, conservative city of Cincinnati and landed in uh, loud, aggressive, uh, dusty Brooklyn in 1998. And uh, Brooklyn 98 was a little different than it is now. Um, some changes have happened, but when I got here, I was scared to death. I'd never seen 100 people literally cross the street at once, and I was, uh, I was terrified. But I didn't let fear uh, render me uh, useless, and I began to go on this aggressive roller campaign uh, of putting my name out there. In this particular case, uh, verb is put on a building in a roller style of graffiti that was uh, popularized, popularized by Cost and Revs, who are from New York. Now, just to give you a sense of scale, you see that ventilation shaft to right below the R and the B? My head is about two feet shorter than that. So this kind of work is done within the space of a night. We're talking four hours. So after that uh, night of rolling, my <laughs> shoulders were extremely sore, to say the least. So. As Verbs, recently a transplant from Cincinnati, I'm going around the streets of New York and I am pumping Verbs out there in as many different ways as possible. But I'm also not forgetting the alternative forms of graffiti that I learned in Cincinnati, Ohio. So for this particular piece, um, this is a self-portrait. You see, I'm representing Cincinnati uh, and, I'm, and I'm expressing that through uh, you know, the, the, the hat that I never took off for a year inside of a painting. And this was put in, uh, a C train, I believe, um, in around 1999. And also here is a example of a phone sign that is using the font that phone signs used at the time, which is Helvetica Bold, and I'm just switching around the colors a little bit. So you can see I'm toying around with different forms, but I'm still attached to the name, verbs, 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 verbs. Also the subway was a new phenomenon for me, and I figured I got to get my hands on this 
uh, somehow, some way. So here I am with a, uh, a sign that I got from uh, Clinton Washington Station. And here is a sign that I put up right below a police station in Canal Street. I'm sure we all are familiar with that one. Um, and people to this day still, this is from the year 2000, as you can see in the date there, 14 years later, still bring this one up as one of their favorites. It's a hallmark because it, Verb Street, oh yes I did, it personifies an inanimate object. And that's a theme that I, ran, I run on still today. Um, but this is the first instance in which um, I'm able to express that. Now, um, at Pratt Institute, um, I met two individuals that were extremely important in my development. Um, as you see throughout my speech, you're going to see a cast of colorful characters, and they all have contributed to the development of my personal work. To the left is a guy named Quinnell Jones. To the center, Brad Downey and me on the right. Uh, Quinnell Jones and Brad Downey were film students at Pratt Institute. And they approached me and said, hey, we see you going out <laughs> on the street with a hard hat and a vest and doing all this graffiti stuff. <laughs> Can we film you for our uh, our thesis film to graduate? And answer was, of course, why not? Um, I could use a hand, you know, cartering around all this ladder, you know, all these ladders and equipment. So sure enough, they were filming me and also helping out. Brad Downey and I became exceptionally close and we began to trade ideas back and forth. And at some point, Brad Downey went from behind the camera as an objective observer of this new form of art and began to be an active participant. He began to help me install. He began to uh, actually paint on some signs together. So I didn't know it at that point, but this would be my second great collaboration on the street. Now, for those of you all who have been in a collaborative relationship before, you know that the first uh, uh, kind of manifestation of your collaborations are not exactly the prettiest. And I'm showing you the back of this sign because the front is so ugly that I don't even want to show you. I just, I'm just showing this just to show you that, that this is how we were being uh, calling ourselves, verbs and downy. Okay? Uh, so you can see uh, Brad is kind of echoing what I'm doing in a sense, uh, just like I echoed what I learned from uh, looking at the graffiti grapevine, you know, all the New York City train riders, I was doing the same thing. But here, Brad is uh, kind of echoing uh, kind of, kind of what's, what, what I'm doing there. So as you can see here, a vertically uh, oriented verb sign here, and it's kind of mimicked in a, uh, a vertically oriented downer sign here, which is a, a play on Downey's own name. And that's another thing. Downey never uh, choose, chose a different name. He always used his real name. Now, to make the story more complicated, at Pratt, I met a girl at that point, a woman now named Polina Soloveitchek, who grew up in communist Russia. You never would have known it, though. She per spoke perfect English, and you'd never hear a trace of an accent. Phenomenal, phenomenal illustrator. I fell in love with Polina Soloveitchek, and it just blew my mind. I had never been in love before. This is my first love with this woman. And um, things started to change. And I'm sure you all can relate the first time you've been in love. Things change. You see things completely differently. And I added up. I said, you know, I'm in love with this woman. Um, and I have no way to express that. How can verbs express the love that I felt? And then, it, then I looked back on my experience with Andre Highland, who never wrote a name, hardly. The name wasn't important. And Brad Downey using his own name, and he was doing some wild out things too. And here I am in love, and I have no way to express that. So verbs began to be a wall, a barrier, from which I could express myself. So I dropped it. My drawings began to change incrementally. And then any time an artist's drawings begin to change, their paintings begin to change. Now, I was doing just as many criminal activities doing this type of work that I was doing verbs, but the message changed. There's content here now. Love you. It doesn't get any more simple or expressive than that. Get up, y'all, is kind of a positive message, a jolt of inspiration that I wanted to transmit to people. So at this point, I cut ties with the old traditional graffiti writing 
about just the name, the name, the name, and began to d discover what I could say to society or give to society. And humor began, humor and context began to be important. Now, this is a sketch for a piece called Who Farted? This was painted right on the Ohio River. Not, <laughs> doesn't smell too good there at all, actually. Uh, now, why would this piece not work in front of a perfume factory? So here I am. I'm trying to give it, give, uh, uh, really take your experience and justify it or, 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 or make it more real in a sense. I'm taking a specific area under specific circumstances and reflecting that. And the joke is gotten because we all know if you're there, it smells bad. So this is a first instance where context, site-specific context, is coming into my work. This is a sketch for a piece called The Gift. The Gift was painted in Soho. Why was it painted in Soho? Because it's a gift, it's a shopping area. Now this is a great picture that shows you scale here. Um, now if, if Brad Downing was to go further back to the wall, he'd even be smaller than that. Okay, and this is all done within the si inside of one night. <clears throat> and for continuity's purposes, this new form of work for me is being signed under a name called Darius Jones the most simple Anglo-Saxon name you can think of, and it's painted extremely small. And I did that just for continuity's purposes, but for all intents and purposes, identity kind of shrunk and content began to be important. And at this point, again, I didn't know it at that point, but I had one foot inside of what we now call street art, and the other pretty much going from graffiti into the street art, even though I never would have gone to a party and said, hey guys, I'm a street artist now. I would have been laughed out of the building in the, in the year 2000. Would have been laughed out. So now, as a collaborative force, myself and Brad Downey began to be known as Darius and Downey, or Darius und Downey. As you can see here, we traveled around the world doing this type of work. Now, one of our first hits that we did, uh, this was right across the um, Manhattan Bridge in Chinatown. If you st it's been many, many times painted over, but if you still look at this building, you can still see the outlines of that uh, lettering that says, Clone Jesus. And just to show you, exemplify how over the tops of people's heads this kind of new work was, a graffiti writer friend of mine came up to me after seeing that, and he said, yo, man, that's cool, um, but uh, who's Clone and who's Jesus? He didn't know that it was a message to clone Jesus, because in the year 2000, I think they cloned a sheep, I think. And we, it was an inside joke between myself and Brad, like, yo, why, why don't they just take the a sample from the Shroud of Torin and take a DNA sample and clone him? And that's the way Christians are going to get Jesus back after 2,000 years. So we painted that, and um, graffiti writers were just like, who's clone? Like, yeah, they're asking, who's, who's Jesus? So just, that's just to show you. Now, this is a work that was a little bit more popular and understandable, Honk If You Love Graffiti painted right opposite the Brooklyn Queens Expressway. Uh, and I believe that building is still there, even though it's long been painted over and it says con men at this point. But uh, this, again, shows site specificity and context and interaction. Because after Brad and I painted this, we came up to the hill. You have to go up on a hill to, to, to see the BQE. And we heard a lot of honking in that particular area. This is results that I could have never have achieved as verbs. And uh, in Berlin, but myself and Brad were invited to an exhibition in Berlin to make graffiti. Um, we decided to, uh, in this particular case, paint a magnifying glass to show just how big this painting was. So you see those two figures there? That's the actual size of myself and Brad Downey. And we figured, hey, we're in Berlin. Let's deface these people's property with their own language. And we're going to say, um, we would try to say original groza, uh, but we misspelled it and it says original groza. But I think that most Germans could understand uh, where we're coming from. Uh, this is another piece in Berlin in a neighborhood called Kreuzberg. Now, every May 1st, Germans go to this particular neighborhood and throw Molotov cocktails. I have absolutely no idea why. My wife perhaps could tell you why, but um, we decided to kind of uh, uh, show that this is a, an expressive creative act. So we decided to paint a Molotov cocktail on a roof that says, Aber es ist doch Kunst. It means, but it is art. 
And that piece lasted there for many, many years. I don't know if it's still there, but every time I go back, it's still there. So it's been allowed to exist. Why? Because we're speaking directly to a specific population and they're understanding it. Now at Pratt, just to bring it back a little bit back to home, at Pratt, I am playing and toying around with new medium. As you can see, my ideology for making illegal work has changed, but now I'm changing the physical format of my work. I decided to take a welding course at Pratt, so I learned how to manipulate, shape, cut, and weld steel. And what that did was it took my two-dimensional ideas and pushed them into three dimensions here. Add to that that myself and Brad Downey acquired a hammer drill at this point. Okay, so for anybody who doesn't know what a hammer drill is, a hammer drill has the power to actually drill into concrete. I could drill into this floor right now if I had a hammer drill. A, hammer dr a cordless hammer drill allows you to do that same thing, but anywhere. Now, couple the veil of daytime, the veil of daytime, think about that, a hard hat, a vest, um, a hammer drill, and the fact that this was in the early 2000s when people still weren't hip to any of the street art stuff. Imagine what you could get away with. This is one of my favorite pieces uh, that was in this location for nine years. Um, this is actually Broadway. Um, this is the, the JMZ and is right where the um, BQE crosses underneath it. Um, this is a work called Fleur d'Acier, which is a French title, uh, means uh, flower of steel. And uh, it was drilled there and there were many times where construction units would be parked next to it. And I thought, this is it, it's gone. I'm never gonna see this thing again. And it was still there. Year after year after year, this work was still here. It was allowed to exist. And this is a work that is, is contextual. It's a chain that is welded in the form of a snake. Now, why would this not work in a parking lot? Obviously because we don't chain up our cars, but it works here. So as Darius Jones, I'm really toying, I'm letting the site inform what I'm doing, not the other way around, because as a graffiti artist, the idea is to write your name until it has meaning. Just repeat, repeat, repeat till it has meaning. Here, I'm taking the meaning of an area and reflecting it, having a different take on it. And all that stuff, remember at the School for Creative and Performing Arts, remember all that Picasso and all the Vincent Van Gogh, all that stuff that I thought was garbage at the time, it went at this point from my subconscious into my conscious and I adopted techniques of portraiture and put it in the language of the street. So instead of me painting with oils in my nice studio, I'm welding in the steel and hammer drilling into buildings. And when I am oil painting, I'm doing it in, in the context of the street where you can see here, if this was in Williamsburg, um, I can't remember exactly the street. Um, there's, there's actually the, um, the Williamsburg Bridge in the back there. Uh, if you happen to be using this phone on a pay phone, put in your quarter, you look up, first thing you would notice, hey, that's not an ordinary phone sign. Then you look and say, wait a minute, um, that's the energy drink ad that's right behind me, and actually that's the dumpster that's behind me too. That chain link fence looks familiar. Uh, it's a portrait of the environment. But instead of you looking up at yourself, it's me saying, hello. So that's my take on Western European painting in the language of the street. And when I am painting in landscape form, I'm doing it with a little bit of an urban twist. This is a work called Yellow Brick Road to the Projects. The, uh, the imagery is obviously derivative of uh, The Wizard of Oz. And instead of this yellow brick road leading to Oz, this mystical, magical place where everything can happen, it's leading to the public housing projects right in the back that actually existed uh, on that block. So I'm trying to take the viewer out of reality and put them back in. And at this point, I was trying to be altruistic to give something to society. So this piece is in Gowanus, probably the most man-made place in New York City, I would say. There's not a tree in sight, hardly, except for that one back there. But what I wanted to do is that if a pedestrian or a, a car was sitting at the stoplight, to give them a moment's respite, just to escape and be on their way, you see. And this is a, uh, a piece that was painted in my verbs days in the style of Vincent Van Gogh. As Darius Jones, years later, I decided to be cheeky and make a mini-me version of the verb sign and put it right next to it as a joke. And that led to a more important work, one that was a little bit more universal. And this is a work called Baby Stop Sign. 
Now, the baby stop sign is important because it personifies a, living, a, a dead object. And if you were kind of going with this illusion, uh, maybe you'd come back next month and maybe that stop sign would be a little bit bigger. Maybe next year, even a little bit bigger. And then maybe two years down the road, the stop sign would be fully grown and, and, and holding its own, its own block. So this work really opens up a new uh, development in making you see the urban environment just a little bit differently. You can relate to the urban environment with your emotions. And not forgetting humor and context. This is the West Fourth Court. It's everybody been there, I'm assuming, before, right? Very famous basketball court in the village. And uh, I decided to be funny and exploit the environment in here. This is a basketball community, so there's a no parking zone there. And sure enough, you can't dunk there either. You can, you can, you can free throw all you want, but dunking is off limits uh, until some wise guy decided to go up there and, and dunk on it. Now, I don't know how they did that. I have a theory about this one. I think that someone jumped up, someone climbed on this phone booth and jumped up there. As you can see, that's about 15 feet tall. That's much higher than your uh, standard basketball uh, uh, hoop. But I love this piece because someone <laughs> made a statement about it. And what it tells, tells you a little something about human nature. Once you tell someone not to do something, that's exactly what they're going to do. I also decided to use um, America's racial past. Uh, we're all familiar with the Jim Crow laws um, that barred uh, blacks and whites from using basic civil amenities such as water fountains, telephones, bathrooms. And decided to put it on its head. So this is a phone sign uh, that says white, in, white only on one side and colored only on the other. So it's a complete contradiction unless you're black on one half and white on the other. Um, that lasted about 12 hours uh, before it was ripped down. Uh, <laughs> didn't, didn't last too long there. Now, um, just to kind of bring it back to a point, uh, you remember Pauline Soloveitchik, the, the, the woman who I fell in love with and uh, just flipped my whole world around and really kind of got me on this whole experiment um, with Darius Jones. Um, she dumped me. Uh, ripped my heart in shreds, to be honest. And um, I expressed that feeling through this piece here, where you've got a, uh, a man, a male figure, chasing up, you know, running up a flight of steps, chasing after a female figure. Not my favorite piece at all, but it is expressive uh, of what I was feeling at the time. Now I ask you, how would verbs have expressed that feeling? Couldn't have. So, I am forever, forever grateful to Polina for allowing me to discover this part of myself and express uh, uh, my feelings through uh, what we now call street art. But after the breakup, I didn't forget what it was like to be in love. So this piece shows a little bit of that tenderness that we all have in a relationship where you've got a, a phone sign that's a little down and out. Uh, maybe it's not getting the quarter revenue that it's used to uh, getting <laughs> from the cell phone revolution. And uh, a one-way sign is tapping it on its head, saying it's all right. There'll be another day. Now, in 2003, myself, Brad Downey, and Quinnell Jones had all graduated from Pratt Institute, and we decided to do a little bit of uh, change of setting. So we left New York City and landed in uh, you know, bright, sunny London. Uh, <laughs> and we decided to uh, continue on this agenda of making street art, but we had to change some things. Number one, chiefly our uniform. Uh, they don't wear orange construction uh, vests in, in London, so they have this lemon yellow neon vest, so we had to adopt that. Also, we had to keep in mind our accents would betray us, so we didn't want to go around with this American accent and have people thinking, why are Americans doing construction work? Uh, not very common. So we had to keep our voice down. But more importantly is the visual change that happened with the work. This is a work called Bobby Behind Bars. Now just the title alone tells you that this is work that's coming from a British standpoint. Of course, we don't call cops Bobbies here. We also, our cops uh, don't also wear lemon yellow vests as they do over there. So the visual nature of our work changed because of the geography. Now, if you guys have all been to London, Stephanie, I know you've been to London many times. The first impression that I got when I got there was there's a lot of cameras here. Um, 
you know, you, you'll, you'll go into the train station and see a, pill, a, a, a pillar and have literally like 50 cameras wrapped around um, the, 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 the pillar. Now, keep in mind, most people don't know this, about half of them are fake. They just want the impression of observation. So I took that circumstance and decided to flip it on its head where I bought two fake video cameras and made them, uh, installed them right around the corner to give the impression that perhaps one is not up to something that it should be doing and they're observing each other. That's one take. Another take is that they're in love themselves. They have affection. There's the wide out shot where you can see the context. Also, what was striking to me when I first got there in 2003 was the fact that they had iconography to denote where people should walk and don't walk. In New York City and mo most parts of America for a long time, we had either walk or don't walk. Hello. And when I got there and saw the imagery, I said, well, let me try to personify this character. Let me try to give a, a direction, kind of a, um, you know, a, a personality to this ubiquitous uh, 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 imagery. And I love this picture because this figure here, the green man, is walking in the opposite direction uh, of, of all the other people and he's kind of going his own way. Uh, and so you know while we're in London, myself and Brad have to play around with the, uh, the tube station. And if you see this piece here, even the language uh, has changed. So uh, sit your R's down, of course, we would never do something like that in New York. Uh, and people love that one. I even like to say the guy in the back, even he thinks it's funny there. <laughs> um, now, in London, uh, you're all familiar with, the, this is a, a, some, a piece of street furniture that is native to UK. It's called the Belisha Beacon, and it's a black and white striped pole there. So in this particular case, I decided to make one that was in full blossom and bloom. And writing on that theme of romance that I had learned from Paulina, I decided to make this piece called The Kiss. This is my personal favorite um, because it's so simple, uh, but it says so much at the same time. It's so simple, even this people right here, they don't even know that they're touching uh, a work of art there. It's also my favorite because it's probably the most tragic. Um, it lasted an hour, this piece. And the irony with this piece was that the people that took it away were dressed just like myself and Brad. Lemon yellow vest, hard hat, um, tools, and it was gone. Now, in the year 2004, I believe, myself and Brad Downey split ways. Uh, it happens all the time with creative couples. Bands break up um, for reasons of uh, creative differences, maybe geography. In our case, it was both. Um, Brad Downey relocated to Berlin, Germany, and I um, went back to Brooklyn. Brad continued a career of illegal public work, uh, illegal street art, and I came back to Brooklyn and had to refocus. I said to myself, Leon, you've been writing, you've been running from the police, evading the police, breaking laws for 10 years now. You started in 1995, it's 2005 now. You're 25, do you wanna be doing this at 50? Answer was no, I don't. So I decided to think about what could one do if one had permission, permission and a budget. Um, maybe my ideas could expand. And so just like verbs, remember, was an emotional block to my work, Darius Jones began to be a physical block to my work as a public artist. You see, so whereas in this particular case, maybe uh, Darius Jones might have been able uh, to get off one of those signs, when I had permission and a budget, as I did here, I was able to do uh, two of them. Now, this particular piece is uh, actually currently owned uh, by the city of Peekskill in New York, and it's on permanent display. So this is the, the beginning of my work as a public artist with permission and a budget. So, uh, you know, just the ideas have expanded since that time that I'd made that decision. And this is my first legal installation that was put in uh, the city of Syracuse, New York. And it's called the Grazers, where you've got the parking meters that are normally used to feeding on your quarters, but now they're feeding on the leaves of a tree there. Okay? Now, with, as a public artist, with permission and a budget, I'm able to play around with architecture. 
Now this is a sketch for a piece called Free as a Bird. Now it's put on a prison. Now if I went to my 15 year old self and said, Leon, you'd be making work on a prison. I'd be like, well, what, did, I, did I get caught or something? No, <laughs> I was given permission to do this. So this is a, a work that has, features a turkey vulture. As you can see, it's not the most innocent of birds. <laughs> it eats dead things. Um, it's not a, a peacock or a dove. Uh, and it's trying to fly and be free, but it can't do so because it's padlocked and its, it's talon is chained to the very prison itself. This is a sketch for a work that I made in Sao Paulo, Brazil. And it features a figure that is trying to literally uproot the foundations of the museum. Now, I probably would have gotten the chain up there as Darius Jones, then been busted and carted off to jail. But as Darius Jones, I'm able to uh, expand the ideas. Why? Because I'm allowed to, okay? And all the ideas that I had as Darius Jones, I realized, didn't have to be illegal. I just didn't know any other way. Now, this is a piece called The Great Recession, and it's important for two reasons. Number one, this was, this was done in 2009, the height of the Great Recession around the world. Um, and it would be one of my last times being invited and commissioned, commissioned by museums and galleries. This was placed in Stavanger, Norway. And uh, you've got the, the imagery of Kilroy was here, if you all are familiar. And Kilroy is holding on to his very last dollar, making sure it doesn't blow away. OK? Kind of represents how we were all thinking and feeling. And this is a sketch for a work called um, True Yank, which was placed uh, in Manchester, England, of all places. There's a statue of Abraham Lincoln there, which is another story in, in and of itself. But that was one of the last commissions that I ever got, even today. One of the last ones, OK? And what's important around this time is that 2009, if I'm not mistaken, is that now when Kickstarter? Yeah. So around 2009, museums and galleries were not throwing around money like they did. But Kickstarter comes along. And I, like many people at that point, were skeptical. This can't be working. Th thousands of dollars, this is stuff that grants give away, and no one ever really gets grants at this point. Can't work. I was skeptical for about six months. <laughs> and then I joined the club. Uh, you know, I said, I got to try this out. And my first project, Tourist in Chief, was successful. Blew me away. Uh, you know, the whole grant system is really inherently rigged against the artist, especially in America, where you've got an a, a massive pool of people competing for a shrinking amount of money. And here Kickstarter comes along, and people are, are raising two, three thousand, four thousand dollars in 30 days. Unbelievable. And I tried it. And it worked. And here I am preparing and, and executing that particular project uh, called Tourist in Chief, which you're, uh, you're all familiar with there. Now, getting permission for, for that was extremely difficult. And I could go on about that, but I won't. Uh, but Kickstarter enabled me to realize that project. And here's a white out shot there. Oops, sorry. Now, um, also, I figured, hey, this is good. This Kickstarter thing is pretty good. Let, let me try it and give, give it another whirl here. Um, this is a sketch for a project called The 100 Story House. And um, The 100 Story House uh, got more than twice the amount of money that I got alone with Tourist in Chief. And, and by the way, Tour 100 Story House was a collaboration with a partner named Julia Marchesi, fabulous uh, person to collaborate with. We got so many more backers, and uh, it worked. And here I am in my studio uh, creating, uh, with, with some other uh, helpers, uh, the 100 Story House. And it was a knockout with the community. The community loved it. And it served its purpose as a communal uh, 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 library. And here I am with uh, Gila Marchese and my, myself here, uh, smiling. So um, that is my inspirational background story. Um, I will get into questions in a little bit, uh, but now is the sales pitch. <laughs> um, you've seen from just my personal example the effect that Kickstarter has had on my career, and it's still having, and it will continue to have.
okay? So uh, I would love the opportunity to give something back to Kickstarter, okay? Now, before I go any further, I'd like to know, does Kickstarter have a permanent art collection here? Not yet. <laughs> I, would, I would strongly advise that you start to think about it. Um, and I, I hope I'm not preaching to the converted here, but uh, having a collection, an art collection, whoops, sorry about that. Um, it does three things. I don't know what that is. Um, <laughs> I didn't design that. Number one, chiefly, is that it inspires the workforce, okay? That's the great power of art is it inspires. Let's say you're pissed off one day. You hate your, you hate your coworkers. You hate what you're doing. You hate your bosses. Uh, you hate the environment. And you look at a work, maybe it's a picture of tourist in chief, and you realize how much of a struggle that was to do that piece. And whatever I'm going through, you know, Leon perhaps had it worse trying to convince these people that this was a good idea to put a hat on uh, Washington. And you think to yourself, maybe it's not so bad. Let me get back at it. Um, artwork defines uh, a company's identity. So I know Kickstarter has an extremely strong identity online. Online, we know exactly where you're coming from. You are a conduit for creativity. You embody creativity. But in a physical location, you may not get that impression. So in the physical world, when you bring people here, you want to immediately communicate that, that this is what we stand for. And it doesn't always have to remain the same. You can change out your collection, you see. And for those who want the bottom line and need a, 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 a quantifiable justification for having a collection, it can serve as a financial asset if this company is ever being evaluated for whatever reason. So it serves three purposes. And I believe that uh, Kickstarter should begin to think about a uh, art collection beginning with me. <laughs> uh, with that said, I want to thank you all so much for having me here. And if anyone has any questions, please let me know. <laughs>
Yeah. Uh, I grew up here, so we, I remember the subway yep. stuff. But the work on the freight train really interests me. Oh, yeah. As far as, a, was there any kind of communication mm -hmm. by coastal thing mm -hmm. and everything in the middle? Or mm -hmm. Would you really see and know and remember the artists who were drawing on the East Coast made it to the Midwest and that? Absolutely. Oh, we would see trains all the time from the East and West Coast, and we would p pick them out. Oh, that's so-and-so from, from New York, that's so-and-so from Philly, that's, I mean, we were nerds at this point. Like, that's all we had to study. We were teenagers, and of course, we're going to do our homework with the magazines and the, the flicks. So we would absolutely identify these trains from the East and West Coast, and that was our way to get our work out there to those coasts. So yeah, we, we were disciples of, of, of the freights. So uh, good question. Stylistically, yeah. was there, uh, could you tell differences in just like basic tone and framing? And, and like, how did that hit? You're talking about artwork on the trains, you mean? Well, uh, if you know the trains? here in Cincinnati, you, you're seeing tra uh, trains from the East Coast and the West Coast. Yep, you can. Like, Phil East Coast and West Coast jazz, completely different. Good, like, good point. Good point. So could I identify the, the region of America where, where the origin, graffiti originated from by the actual style? Yes, you can. Philly, Philadelphia has an extremely distinct way of writing graffiti. You can identify it instantly. Uh, the West Coast also has a very distinct style. Um, not that we were looking at trains from Bra Sao Paulo, Brazil, but th there's a style of writing called Picha Sao, which is instantly recognizable. So we would, you know, again, we were teenagers, we were studying the form, so we would just point it out before he had even said Philly or, you know, you know New York. We, we would see, we would recognize it. So, uh, yeah, that's a good question. Yes? Can you kind of talk a little bit more about how you made the transition from being sweetheart into commission work? Mm -hmm. And then uh, talk about how, what happened when that dried up? Okay. Good point. So uh, when I got back to New York from being in London, I decided, I, I, I recessed myself and said, I don't want to be doing illegal stuff forever. I'm lucky. I'm running on luck. You, luck is not a long-term strategy. <laughs> you know, <laughs> You're not, it's not going to get you very far. Um, so I said, you know, I don't want to be running from the police. Uh, we see what happens to Afri African-American men when they're doing nothing wrong. You see what I'm saying? But when they do do something wrong, you see, that was a factor. So I didn't want to do that. I wanted to have a family, et cetera. So I decided to um, do work with permission and a budget. And at this point, 2004, 2000 to 2009, the museums were very generous. So I was being flown around the world you know, to do these works. And in 2009, we had this you know, terrible financial crisis. And that, of course, affected museum funding. You know, so, uh, you know, I'm sitting here thinking it was just me. That I, do I suck now? You know, what's up? You know, <laughs> I'm not getting any calls. But sure enough, I talked to my artist friends, and they're all like, "Yo, no one's inviting us anywhere." So it just so happened, and I don't know why it happened in 2009, but you know, Kickstarter evolved, and it took me. You know, I think I turned. I think I learned about it in 2000, late 2010, early, early 2011. And I was skeptical initially. I was like, this something, this can't be happening. And, you know, again, I was skeptical for like six months. And then I just jumped on. And it, and it worked, you know. So, you know, there's no going back now. So, um, you know, Kickstarter, came, I think it came out of a need for funding when governments were shrinking up. Government, well, arts funding in America never really did exist. The NEA doesn't give an individual grant. So it came out of a need. And, you know, that, that, that need, you know, produced you know, the ability for this to, to happen. Also, the technology being available. So, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm just one of the lucky people to have been born at this time where that could happen, you know? Whereas 20 years earlier, I'd be applying to grants that, you know, don't exist, or, you know, statistically, uh, I was up against, I'd be up against great odds to get that money, so, yeah, good. yes? Um, it's a little bit of a different thing, but I've noticed a bunch of companies are wrapping subway cars yeah. in brands or, you know, Vimeo's is pretty artistic. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Wondering what you think about that. I think, where did you guys get that idea from? <laughs> <laughs> but that's the natural course in American culture. It's, it can only stay, you know, for the love of it for so long. And then, sure enough, it begins adopted into marketing and then it's exploited for its maximum profit. and. Um, you know, hey, you know what I mean? That's just the way it goes. I have no resentment towards it. It's just the natural way that, that things go. So, um, but it's nice to know that graffiti writers had such a, an impact on, on, on culture that way, that they would be imitating that. Yes? Uh, I feel like a lot of the street art 
nowadays is made for an audience that is on the internet, like they sort Absolutely. of streak of them mm -hmm. photograph. Yes. But it seems like your stuff was much more like yeah, it was meant to be experienced because that was the only thing. We only had your, a physical experience to relate to. We, the internet was there, but it was so, I didn't know really how to use it in 2001. You know what I mean? I didn't, I think I opened my first Yahoo account in like 2002. And um, I just didn't know how to, 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 to do that. Most of my peers didn't. So it was just about what you could get away with. And, and, and you know, literally drilling into the concrete uh, it, this wouldn't doesn't really happen now because you can put it there and you can flick it and you take it and you put it online and it is it exists there, and um, you know it, it's I'm not going to say one is better than the other but it, it it is what it is now if I was still in doing street art maybe I would try to get into that you know method methodology why go out and put yourself at risk like that and expose yourself like that when you can just flick it and you can get this, <laughs> the same exposure if not more it's just a different time that's all. So, um, yeah, yes? How do, you, uh, how do you cope with or just like mm -hmm. understand the ephemeral nature of a like that? Mm -hmm. It's probably going to disappear in like five minutes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I do, yeah. How do you give it up? How, it, 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 it is. It is. So I'm sure we've all been there. How do you give up your work after you put so much time and effort? And there's a quick antidote I have with that. Um, I put up a street sign in New York um, around like 99, 2000, and um, it, it was stolen within a week. It's just gone. Broke my heart because I put so much work into it. I said, let me do another one. Um, and let me put two times as much effort into it and put it up there. Gone within a week. Two weeks later, sure enough, I'm walking around the same area in Soho. <laughs> and not only one sign was there, but two signs was on a, a board here next to a merchant <laughs> who was selling it. And he was a street artist himself. And we got into kind of like a verbal altercation. He said, yo, man, once you put it outside, it's not yours anymore. <laughs> and I was pissed off at the time. But then I think, you're right. You have a psychological thing. Once you put it outside, it's not yours anymore. So you don't get, you don't get emotionally as attached to it. Now, if it lasts an hour, sure, but, um, but yeah, it's just, uh, you, you got to divorce yourself a little bit to the, the idea of owning it once you put it out there. So you, it's something you have to, it takes time and, uh, it, you know, experiences like that certainly inform the way you think about it. Um, any other, yes? Uh, you were talking uh, about creating pieces that reflected the environment, mm -hmm. and I was curious, you know, after you put these pieces up, there seems to be like an observational component where you would sit back and see how people would interact yeah. and say, oh, this was gone in an hour or this. I was wondering if there were any times when your expectations of how uh, a particular piece was going to be interacted with mm -hmm. was ended up being completely different than how. Oh, yeah. Okay. So how did someone react to something and was it completely different? Um, you know, I, I don't have, to, yes, I do. Um, I made a piece in London where it was not the best piece. I, don't, I didn't show it. It's not aesthetically very great, but it was a woman cut out of like three quarter inch plate steel, extremely heavy stuff. And um, I was like, I thought to myself, yeah, this isn't, I was like, well, I was thinking like, okay, it's, it's kind of cool, not too, too cool. Uh, someone puts, someone likes, locks their bike up to it and uses it as a function. <laughs> it's like, oh, I'm glad I could provide that, that service to you guys. I'm, I'm glad that, you know, um, yeah. Um, and then there was another time in Paris where I did, a, um, not, again, not the best piece. It was a, a heart that was cut out of diamond plate steel. Uh, has, you know, diamond plate steel has a texture. And uh, I put it up, and then the next day I come back, and I see, like, a trail of dog droppings that basically end up on the plate. So someone had used it to wipe the dog turds off. I would use this, I would do the same thing too, but you know, I was like, okay, that's an interesting, uh, not very flattering, um, but so a very utilitarian interp way of using an artwork. But yeah, I mean, if people, if they're not getting it, they use it, you know, in that particular case in Paris, it was to wipe dog droppings off of their foot or somebody else saw my work as a good place to lock up their bike. So it's, it, it's not as good as having somebody like, you know, praise it and a lot of times some of the stuff was so subtle like you saw in London where the guy was holding the pole he didn't even notice it was there he didn't notice it so um so yeah li li all kinds of reactions to it I have a yes question at the top of here Hi. Yes. <laughs> how's it going yeah uh, this is a ridiculous logistical question 
yeah. that I'm always wondering about. For your pieces that are like up on a wall that yeah. are large, like this, yes. do you read them leaning over the side? And you do. Long? You do. Some of them, yeah. Some of the ones you, you, you do, um, you go like this. And it's just the oddest experience to try to paint something accurately. When you're looking down, you've got this vertigo, sens vertigo sensation where everything uh, kind of compresses there. And uh, adrenaline can make you do a lot of different things that you didn't think were possible. If you have adrenaline, time pressure, another person doing the same thing, and you want to you know, kind of keep pace with them, a lot of things can happen. So. If you put the punk if you like graffiti, graffiti. Like, is that like a two hour thing? Or like that, was, that, was three, that was about three that was about three to four hours and that's done with uh, extension poles that when you, when extended can be up to twenty feet. And also you bring a ladder there with you. So on your ladder and your extension pole, you can get pretty high. You know, you can get up to I'd say about the, the, that that's that one of those um, rectangles up there, you can get pretty high, you know. And you go with, um, you know, I had Brad Downey for a lot of them, and Cornell Jones, who's kind of like the silent kind of hero in this all thing, he was there too, actually. So he was filming and kind of helping out. So um, yeah, you, you get people together, adrenaline, and, and a difficult situation, and you can do a lot of things. It's a good question. Um, yeah, so. Uh, do you have any dream locations? Pieces, yes. I do have a dream piece called A Spider Lurks in Brooklyn, and I decided not to show that particular piece tonight because it's not realized, but that was one of the first things I, I was thinking about as uh, dropping Darius Jones. Um, I'd like to put a spider crawling around the cables of the Brooklyn Bridge to make it seem as if the spider has woven the bridge itself um, during Halloween season. So it'd be a great kind of, um, kind of uh, attraction, I think, for kids, families alike. Um, not the best time to try to do that because these guys put these this white flag on there, and I'm like, well, okay, that can be a harder sell. It was going to be a hard sell to begin with, but now uh, this happens. Um, yeah, but I'd love to do that. And um, but you know, it's still going to be a good a good idea 20 years from now when I have the the, the funds to do it. So that'd be a dream, you know. Uh, so yeah. I think that that was a great moment to end on. Yeah, thank you. All right. <laughs>